Hello and welcome back to the Ascent Cycling Podcast as we continue on with our team preview series ahead of the 2021 season of cycling. We've had quite a few now and today we will be looking at the German outfit Bora Hansgrohe. They had a pretty good season overall in 2021, claiming, if I'm not mistaken, 21 wins, which was the fourth best in the World Tour. So on paper, looks a pretty good year, Guillaume. Indeed, a very, very solid year. And uh, unlike some of the teams we've covered um, over the past few weeks, this team has actually had quite a lot of riders winning uh, to make this number of 21, not just one rider getting 14 wins. Wink, wink, Arnaud Demar. Um, so, yeah, I think a very solid year. Um, Stage-wise, I think for a team that had um, a focus towards GC, they will be disappointed uh, with the performance of either... Uh, Emmanuel Buchmann or maybe Rafa Maika if you consider him a leader um, but I mean yeah wins wise it's decent um, results wise on a global scale uh, not as good as what Bora was able to give us over the past few years yeah I will say five of those wins were at the Sibiu cycling tour in Romania so I mean not the big Tour de France wins we're, we're used to with the likes of Peter Sagan uh, but yeah, really upping their win count, at least, if nothing else. Um, but they did get a stage at each of the three Grand Tours, so one of the few teams to accomplish that throughout the season. That's correct. However, there is one thing, in my opinion, that's missing from the um, their win recap. It's a one-day classic. I mean, sure, Classica de Almeria and Trofeo Serra de Tramontana. But you're used to see someone like Bora winning a main classic. Like, even an omloop or a race like that. This year... We didn't get to see them. That's very true. I think Peter Sagan and maybe Maxi Shackman are probably their two best types for the the classics, at least in 2020. But they have made some signings, which I think could well help bolster their classics team ahead of 2021. I'd say I'm absolutely loving this transition, Joe. Very well done. Um, but they have indeed signing eight riders and losing six. We'll take a look first at the riders' uh, outgoing of Bora Hansgrohe, first of all, starting with Rafa Maika, uh, who we've mentioned in our UAE podcast. We also have the likes of Jem Pidruka, the uh, rider from Luxembourg, going to Kofidis. Oscar Gatto, I am not sure where he's going. I don't even know if he's going somewhere. He might be retiring. Um, but we also have the likes of Jay McCarthy, the uh, Australian former rider for Saxo Bank, I guess, or Tinkoff. Gregor Mulberger going to Movistar. And finally, the um, other... Polish riders in Pavel Poliansky. Joining them, though, we have some decent names, starting with Wilke Kelderman, who was for um, a decent time one of the main contenders for the Giro last year. Uh, during that, he ended up finishing, I believe, in third position behind Jai Henley and Theo Gegenhardt. He joins the team to replace Rafa Maika, and potentially the biggest signing they have done, I mean, no, for, for sure, the biggest signing they have done with the arrival of the German Nils Polit from Israel startup nation Nils Polit uh, following um, a very difficult 2020 season with uh, the uh, Israeli outfits, hoping to uh, find his uh, his shape of um, of 2019 back where he had um, finished in second place, I believe, of Paris Roubaix. He joins the team alongside some other riders, uh, some very promising youngsters, the likes of Frederick Vandal. Jordi Meus, Giovanni Aleotti, Matthew Walls from Education First, and two German signings in the likes of Ben Zwiehoff and Anton Palzer. It's an interesting one that you're saying Pollitt, the biggest signing for the team. I, I'm i questioning that because I think Wilco Kelderman had a really impressive season for the first time in a very long time as well. He struggled with injuries a lot in his career, as we know. He could have won the Maglia Rosa. He faded in week three of the Giro. We know that all too well by now but in the early stages of the race he was just so good in the mountains we saw him at Torreno as well a very strong rider in the GC finishing fourth place at Torreno Adriatico and really this team we said they were disappointed with their GC performance at the Grand Tours with Emmanuel Bookman really unlucky he fell at the Zofine couldn't really ride the Tour de France and just a wasted year really for Bookman because of that fall at the Dauphiné um, I think the same fool that caused Stephen Kreuzweig to uh, miss the Tour de France as well. But outside of Bookman, 
I'm not sure they've had a genuine rider who I think going in, yes, this guy can podium this Grand Tour. Now they have two, in my opinion. Wilco Kelderman, I see no reason why Kelderman can't fight for an outside podium place or a top five at any of the Grand Tours, to be fair. So him alongside Emmanuel Bookman really is bolstering their GC ambitions, in my opinion. I think it all comes down to one question, uh, which I'm going to ask you right now. Do you think that their best hope for a GC today would be Wilco Kelderman or Leonard Kemner as a leader? As of today, I'm going I'm going Wilco Kelderman for sure. For sure. Definitely. As as of right now, as of in three or four years, my my, my answer I expect will be very different. I'm I'm think I might be a bit reluctant mainly to uh, due to uh, the lack of uh, regularity Wilco Kelderman has had. Um but I mean if he can carry on with the shape he's had on the Giro I think he's a very good signing. Uh, the reason I still back Nils Polite for me as the main signing is that um, I think today Pete Sagan might not be the best cobble rider there is in the peloton. And there might be an opening for Nils Polite to potentially take a leadership position. Now, hold up, right? Pete Sagan, we'll talk about him later. He's still an absolute beast. But I think there's a bigger chance for Nils Polite to be a leader than there is for Wilco Kelderman. It's a really interesting point of discussion and the only race I really see Pollitt being a, a leader on for Bora is perhaps Paris-Roubaix. I'd probably put Sagan ahead of him in most of the other Cobble Classics, even Flanders to be honest. Of course, Sagan is a former winner at Flanders, whereas Kelderman, to me, he can lead one week stage races for sure. He's another, the tier below, the very top tier of Grand Tour contenders, definitely who can achieve top 10s, top 5s at Grand Tours and clearly a podium, as he showed at the Giro. Lenny Kamner, Groschartner, Conrad, these guys are all good as well. Uh, but for now, I see Kelderman definitely as their second best GT rider alongside Manny Bookman. It's an interesting take. And um, I mean, we'll maybe talk about more uh, about Nils Peter a bit more um, in the uh, upcoming minutes of this podcast. But for those who are already listening to, uh, to it on YouTube, let us know what you think of Nils Polite. As we're going to move on to the main talking points of um, this podcast, taking a look at some of the riders and um, what we can expect from the German outfit for this upcoming 2021 season, starting off with the main man, Peter Sagan, the Slovakian 31-year-old, seven times winner of the points jersey on the Tour de France, three-time world champion, 12 stages on the Tour de France, one Paris-Roubaix, one Ronde van Vlaanderen, three Gauvevel game, give me a race, he's won it, and he's had a very, very good year. He actually made his, uh, I believe, his first Giro this year, finishing uh, second of the points certification, winning on the Giro, uh, making him the 100th rider to win on every single Grand Tour, following a very, very um, well-battled Tour de France, where he came short of Sam Bennett for the points qualification, with some uh, some controversy, we'll say, mainly due uh, to, to a stage, we might talk about it uh, a bit more just after that. Also, fourth place in Milan San Remo, fourth place in Milan Torino, I mean, once again, Peter Sagan delivers when he's on a race. It's a really interesting rider to discuss for me heading into 2021 because I think he got a lot of slack last season. He didn't seem to be as competitive in the early season, at least to what people hoped of Peter Sagan and have grown to expect of him now. And really, I think that was due to his raw sprinting ability and to be honest, I think that was a bit harsh because he was up there at the Tour de France among the top five sprinters on many occasions. No, he didn't win a stage at the Tour in a sprint, but he was often on the podium in the top five um, and he came close. Of course, there was some controversy with Sam Bennett, like you mentioned, um, but he can still sprint. He may not be the quickest man in the peloton. I'll give you that, but Peter Sagan can still sprint and he offers so much more than that still. Um, in his career, we know what this man is about. He can win on just an array of different kind of strategies and, and ways of winning a race, which we saw at the Giro where he won uh, to Tortoretto in stage 10, where he went solo for so long on the hills. And I'm a big Peter Sagan fan. And I think 
He's still one of the best riders in the world for sure. He may not be one of the best sprinters in the world, but this man, going into almost any race, he has to be one of the favourites, unless there's a 25 kilometer mountain uh, mountain top finish to end the race. The one thing is that I don't think Peter Sagan ever was the quickest rider in a peloton. I think on a purely flat stage, you've mentioned um, him not being able to win if there's a 25 kilometer um, mountain stage or mountain finish. I think on a purely flat stage, I would not back Pete Sagan if there is Caleb Ewan, if there is Sam Bennett. We've done FDG recently, I think, if there was Arnaud Demar. I'm not sure. But Pete Sagan has shown that he can win despite not being the best sprinter. And this year probably was the biggest one for him on that point because he hasn't got the sprinting ability he's had. And I think he needs to counterbalance it by being smarter and maybe being uh maybe by being sorry a bit more aggressive uh on on the bike or how he does and i think that's probably why he got a lot of slack on the tour de france i remember uh i mean you, the stage with sam bennett even the stage before there was already some controversy i think he um th- there was some ch- shoulder barging with um with another rider i can't remember who um it might have been clement venturini or brian cocar i'm not sure but um peter sagan Coming into 2021, I'm not sure what he's going to do or what he can do because if he wants, he can basically win everything. I think it may have been Hugo Hofstetter actually thinking about it who also, I I think, remember complaining about Peter Sagan at the tour. Um, You mentioned he's won almost everything. You name a race and he's won it. He's won three world championships. He's won... Now, this is where... I feel Peter Sagan has perhaps underperformed for a rider of his calibre in his career. He's won two monuments and yeah, of course, absolutely unreal. You've won two of cycling's biggest five races. We know he's still missing Milano San Remo, which of the five monuments for me is the one that suits him most, to be honest. And it's turned into a bit of a mental battle for him at this race. Not sure whether to leave people out, sit at the back of the group. He's leaving it too late to sprint. Um, of course, losing to Ala Philippe and Kwiatkowski when the three, uh, when the trio went clear a few years ago, and he's come close many times before. That's one area. The monuments. He's got two monuments. For me, I'd have expected Peter Sagan to have maybe claimed a few more in his career, and I think one of the races he will be desperate to win heading into his 30s now, is Milano San Remo. One of the main reasons, in my opinion, as to why Pete Sagan might not have won that many monuments is actually a reason that doesn't really apply to Milano San Remo. But I feel like we've said that if there's a race, Peter Sagan can win it. And if there is a group of riders chasing for a breakaway, or you're in a finish, there's three riders in the first group, and or there's actually there's one rider in the first group, and there's going to be five behind with Peter Sagan in that group. I feel like the other riders will be knowing that there is Peter Sagan. And if you lead out Peter Sagan back on the first group, the chance of you winning becomes really small due to Peter Sagan's presence. And I think now he knows that, which is why sometimes you just... I wouldn't say giving up, but you can see him just not really caring about the result because no one really collaborates with him. And... You've talked about it being a mental battle. I do agree. I think he's complained quite a lot of times, actually, that he wasn't really happy on the bike uh, in some races. It's quite curious. I think he's going to go for Milano San Remo. I do feel like he will win Milano San Remo before the end of his career. And at this point, he will have won four out of the... F- well, three out of the five monuments. I think he still has uh, Lombardia and Liège to win. Could we potentially see a Pete Sagan aiming for that all five monuments classic toward the end of his career. He still has about six to seven years. I think everything is possible, yet. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think Il Lombardia is probably out of reach, to be fair. I think Liège, maybe he can win it. I think the most recent parkours where we have a flatter finish back into Liège definitely suits him more. So maybe I think that could be a race he, he could potentially win at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, completely fair point on... He's a marked man. He's got a target on his head before the race has even begun. Um, if we look at the Tour of Flanders, even in 2018, I know Nicky Terpstra went clear. There was a small group behind. Peter Sagan looked strong. And no one would work with him because they'll think, you're going to beat me in the end, so I'm not working with you. And 
He's his own worst enemy, I guess, in, in that sense, because he's too quick for everyone else. It, it, it's a it's a card that Sagan's going to have to deal with, for sure, for the rest of his career. Um, whether he can claim any more monuments, I think two monuments for me is under par of what you'd expect of a rider of Peter Sagan's ability and a rider that just goes into every monument as one of the top favourites. I think he'll be dis- disappointed with that in his own mind somewhat. If he can claim Milano San Remo, three monuments, three different monuments, I think he'll be a lot more happy. His classic palmarès doesn't uh, reflect the rider he is. Um, and you mentioned Liège being uh, having a flatter finish. Uh, I do think that's probably one of the reasons that's why he could do it. But I think he's also a rider that when he puts his mind to something, he can achieve it. And I was actually looking back um, at some of his previous results. He's actually won a tour of California, which is, I mean, it's a race that needs some decent climbing abilities. And um, I think he finished 40 seconds behind someone like Julien Lafilippe back in 2015, ahead of some riders like Robert Hessink, Hamas Belgia. Now, sure, he's not the best climber, but I think if he really wants to win Lombardia, I don't know. If everything goes his way, he's also a very decent downhiller. We haven't talked about this, but he is one of the most skilled riders when it comes to a downhill. Maybe I'm just dreaming about him winning all five. You mentioned uh, you being a fan of him, but I also really like Peter Sagan. So we touched on him earlier in the pods, and I think a rider who just a wasted season in 2020 is Emmanuel Bookman. And Emmanuel Bookman came fourth in the Tour de France in 2019, just behind Stephen Kreuzweig missing out on his first Grand Tour podium. He's now 28 years old. I always think of him as quite an up-and-coming rider, but now in his late 20s already, and he still hasn't claimed a Grand Tour podium. I think he'll be going for that this year. He's riding the Giro. We've spoken about how strong the Giro start list is, and Bookman is a rider who I think is really strong. I really rate Bookman. I think he's underrated as a whole by a lot of people in and around cycling, even maybe by his rivals as well, Um, because he's good He's not just a pure climber. He can do more than that. We've seen him go solo numerous times to win races at the Mallorca Challenge. Um, he's won stages at Itzulia. And at the Giro d'Italia, I really believe Emmanuel Bookman could be a name the other riders and just cycling fans in general should be looking out for perhaps more than they are already. I think there is a comparison to make here. Now, Emilio, it, it's not exactly the same, but I do see Bookman some somewhat like a Kroivek, in the sense that he's often under, uh, underrated when it comes to a Grand Tour, um, sometimes overlooked by, you've said, uh, other riders in the race. Uh, he hasn't win, won a lot in his career. I mean, he started cycling in 2012, his World Tour since 2017, I think, uh, but he was in Bora uh, with the uh, Leopold Koenig era, and he's only won four times for a rider that is that good, I guess really remembers, uh, or re- reminds me, sorry, of Kroveg, who hasn't won a lot, I think. Well, his main result, sorry, was obviously fourth at the Tour de France. Um, I'm pretty certain I'm one of the person who criticised that, that result, because I felt like there was a lack of um, aggressivity, a, a lack of attacks from Buchmann. Now, looking back at it, he is a rider that sometimes attacks, but I think if he was to maybe be a bit more willing to to move on the Tour de France. I genuinely believe that that third place was his for the taking on the Tour because Kravec just had to defend. And, I mean, the battle, ever since Pino uh, withdrew from the race, the battle was basically finished uh, f- for the podium. So, he doesn't have a podium, but in my mind, I really feel like he could have gotten one. And um, it'll be interesting to see what he does on the Giro with such... A massive start list. One thing I will say on that is this man had never finished in the top 10 of a Grand Tour before that Tour de France and it still remains his only top 10. He was knocking on the door of a of a podium so perhaps he just wanted to stay within himself, not overexpend energy early in the race um, and just hold on to what he had because it was by far better than anything he'd done before at the Tour de France which he'd, he's ridden a few times in his career. He's never been to the Giro d'Italia, to my surprise. He's been a man who's focused on the Tour a lot in his career. 
and I just feel like he is underrated so much. In 2019, he was he was strong throughout the year. And then in 2020, he was ill at the UAE Tour. He then went to the Dauphiné and was right up there. Third and fourth on stage two and three. Then he crashed out and his season was, was not what it wanted to be. He did go to the Tour de France, but couldn't compete for GC. He wasn't in fitness at all for the race. And... I just feel he could be overlooked somewhat. Maybe he needs to add some more aggressive riding to his game. Um, perhaps I do agree with you there. He's often a defensive rider. And perhaps we should see him go solo a bit more at the Grand Tours um, in particular. Because when in Mallorca, at the Mallorca Challenge, <laughs> I know it's it's the Mallorca Challenge, not a Grand Tour, not numerous stages in a race. But he goes solo for over 50k sometimes and just wins by, by over a minute. Um, which he's done before. So he, he does have the ability to be aggressive, go solo and attack. Maybe just needs a little more confidence to, uh, to do it at the Grand Tours. Yeah, I think he needs the confidence on a bigger stage. And you've mentioned his fourth place being his best ever result. Uh, I think that's probably why he was actually quite conservative, uh, which I do understand. Uh, but with the likes of Kelderman now in his team and a rider we'll talk about in Leonard Kemner, um, I think there is genuinely some material for him to do well and being overlooked by some of his competition might actually work in his favour because they actually won't expect him to do well. Now, Pascal Ackermann, the German 27-year-old sprinter, two-time stage winner on the Giro, two-time stage winner on this year's Vuelta a España, um, who will be doing the Tour de France this year. I am quite curious to see how it's going to work out having Pete Sagan and Pascal Ackermann in the same team. Uh, but he's a very capable rider, a very fast rider as well. Uh, probably one of the strongest one when it comes to um, to a, a bone sprint. He's had some very strong results throughout the entire year, starting off with the Spanish challenges or the trofeos, sorry, um, finishing uh, second both in Playa and Felanich. Uh, winning in Almeria, winning on the UAE Tour, narrowly missing out, I think, uh, in Paris-Nice, and then being, I think, runner-up of his national championship. Um, I can't remember if it was a breakaway win. He was beaten by Marcel Maison of Alps and Phoenix in a sprint, somehow. Oh, yeah, so it was a sprint. Okay, so I, th- I thought, oh, yeah, he launched too early, I think. Yeah, 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 okay, I remember. He did launch too early. Uh, but overall, a very solid 2020 season for Pascal Ackermann. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be looking out. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for him because he's a very fast rider, as I said. And uh, in a Bora team without Sam Bennett and um, him basically being the main sprinter, I'm very curious to see how he's going to uh, to work alongside the Slovak Peter Sagan. When I think back to his previous season, to be honest, I didn't... I didn't find it that impressive, but on paper, it, it looks brilliant, to be fair. Two Grand Tour stage wins, like I said, plenty of other top three podium results, other wins elsewhere to Renault, uh, elsewhere too. So great season for, for Ackerman in retrospect, to be fair to the man. Um, riding the Tour de France. Now, how are they going to play that with Sagan? Can you imagine Peter Sagan leading Pascal Ackerman out? Because I, I certainly cannot imagine that, but... I, I can't see it the other way either because I think Ackerman probably is slightly quicker right now than Peter Sagan in a pure in a, in a pure sprint. So what do you think? Is Sagan leading out Ackerman at the tour? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea how that's going to work because Sagan is not going to come here just to be a, a leader man. If he goes to the Tour de France, it's to get stages and the green jersey. He's going to have a revenge as well on the Tour de France because he probably feels a bit robbed after last year's um, events, I mean, I actually was quite surprised when I was when I just saw that Pascal Ackermann was doing the Tour de France. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. It really is. But Ackermann, I mean, it might, a sprint between Ackermann, Caleb Ewan, Sam Bennett and Arnaud Demar. Honestly, I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm with you there. I remember when Sam Bennett was at Bora, the thing that really pushed him to leave was he wasn't allowed on the Tour de France because Peter Sagan is their sprinter at the Tour de France. Um, so they sent Bennett to the Giro for Welter if he wanted to as well. Um, but he wasn't really given a role at the Tour. So Pascal Ackerman 
on the German team, of course, has been given that opportunity uh, or, or is set to be given that opportunity alongside Peter Sagan. I, I am absolutely intrigued. Peter Sagan will not lead Pascal Ackerman out at the Tour de France. I'm, I'm certain. I cannot imagine that in the slightest. The thing is, usually Peter Sagan goes on the Tour de France, doesn't really need his own lead out. He usually, he's very good at um, shouldering people, I guess, and uh, taking the wheel of a main sprinter. So, yeah, I'm quite confused, especially knowing that I'm going to guess Bora will be aiming for um, some nice GC results. Uh, we said Burman was going to uh, to the Giro, but, I mean, Kelderman and Kemna, I think if they're going to the France, they're not going there to finish 21st. So, uh, their team is going to be stacked. They're going to need climbers, they're going to need lead-out men, which is something they did not need when they had Pete Sagan. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an odd decision from the German outfit. One rider who almost missed his place at the Tour de France last season is Maxi Schachmann, I think crashing at the end of Il Lombardia, strangely taking place just ahead of the Tour de France, um, due to a, a driver on the course who shouldn't have been there. Bizarre crash, bizarre fashion. Luckily, Schachmann was okay to ride the Tour de France two weeks later. He almost got a stage win on the Puy, uh, the Puy Mary, I think beaten by his teammate Kemner and Danny Martinez that day. He wasn't quite in his best shape, I believe, at the Tour de France. And to be honest, I'm not sure he was in his best shape really post-lockdown as a whole after that crash at Il Lombardia. He was he was third at Strada Bianca beforehand, looked good there. He won Paris-Nice before the coronavirus break as well, winning a stage also at Paris-Nice. And that is maybe the biggest win of Shackman's career so far. In fact, I'll probably definitely say it is um he's he's a riser i think can win a real range of races now from the likes of paris nice to the arden classics to even the likes of ronde van vladeren why not um as well as a whole range of other one week stage races as well where do you see shackman and what do you, and what do you see him doing in in 2021 i'm trying to find a comparison for shackman because um i mean the the guy can win on a lot of terrains. Um, you've mentioned his uh, win at Paris-Nice. Uh, I don't know if he was the strongest on Paris-Nice, if I'm being realistic, uh, but I think he was the most complete rider. And he's now 27. He got a top 10 on the ro- on the World Champs this year. Um, but, I, yeah, I think I'm in agreement with you. He wasn't in um, the best of shape throughout the entire year. But we know he can win races, and... I'll be quite interesting to see how he's going to do in, in 2021, uh, especially on the Ardennes, uh, going back to uh, where he finished third on Liège Bastogne Liège mainly. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't really know where to put him. He can climb well. He goes over hills very well. He's quite fast. He's a very decent time trialist. Ideally, he's got the complete array of stats to potentially aim for a GC. I think he does. I think his big climbing ability on the big mountains is probably where he's let down there, to be honest with you. Um, I'm not sure he's quite got a, a Grand Tour leadership GC role in him, to be honest. I think on the warm week stage races, he can get away with it, taking time on the other stages. But over three weeks, I don't see him as a GC rider myself. But you mentioned the Ardennes. I see Maxi Shackman as one of the best Ardennes classics riders right now in the peloton for sure. And... If he wins Liège, bust on Liège, even a race like Milan San Remo, um, which I think also suits him, he's got a quick kick in the finish. Even Amstel Gold, why not? I think one of those three races, all on Shackman's calendar in 2021, I would not be surprised in the slightest if we see him claiming one of them and maybe even being a monumental winner by the end of the season as well. Even why not Lombardia, to be fair? I mean, he did get hit by a car, but he wasn't far off that last year. And as you've mentioned, he wasn't in the greatest of shapes throughout the entire season. I think Lombardia suits him as well. For sure, definitely does. The punch he climbs. Um, if maybe he can improve his his longer kind of mid-mountain ability, then this man could be just an unbelievable rider because he, he is quick in a sprint as well. Really quick in a sprint. The final two riders will mention in that kind of um, 
analysis of the team uh, will be the two Austrians, Patrick Conrad and Felix Groschartner. Both riders well and truly in their late 20s, now one being 27, the other 29. Um, with some very similar seasons, to be honest, if we if we take a look at uh, their results of um, of 2020, both of them podiumed their, oh sorry, top 10, my bad, uh, a Grand Tour, Groschartner on the Vuelta, Conrad on the Giro. Um, they are also quite similar in their abilities um, they can climb well. Conrad might be a better classic rider, I think. Uh, he's trained by uh, getting a top 10 on La Flèche Wallonne. Um, but they're also good in time trial. They're very similar rider. I think they fit very well in the Bora Hansgrohe team uh, because they can have their chances on races, uh, but they also know their role and when they need to help their riders or their leaders, um, they usually do so quite well. I think they are lucky to have these two riders, Bora Hansgrohe, because like you say, they seem happy in their roles when on other teams, I think they could definitely gain a bigger leadership role and they're, they're pretty critical. Patrick Comrade was supporting Raffle Mica throughout the Giro d'Italia and in the end, he finished ahead of Mica, who we know wasn't well towards the end of the race, dropping away in the GC. But Comrade could have maybe challenged for a top five if he was perhaps focused on with a team around him um, and Groschartner as well, I think leading his first Grand Tour at the Vuelta, claiming a top 10. And Groschartner really impressed me on the on the punchy, hilliest stages. I think a few times he was right with Primoz Roglic ahead of all the other GC contenders on uh, the shorter hills, the shorter climbs. Um, and I think probably that's where Comrade's speciality is as well. Looking at their schedule, Comrade is uh, set to ride the Giro and the Tour this season, whereas we will see Groschartner also on the Giro but going to La Vuelta again. So these two guys going to the Giro, I think they'll support Bookman there. Maybe they'll try and get more of a leadership role in the other Grand Tours they're riding. Uh, but for sure, I think these guys could pop up at any moment, really, uh, with a nice win, maybe at a Grand Tour or, uh, or a World Tour race elsewhere. I think their teammate role is um, quite well shown by going on the Giro, uh, the both of them helping um, someone like Emmanuel Bourman. What I'm a bit more um, interested in will be the uh, the Tour de France for Pascal for Patrick Conrad, sorry, because he's gonna go there with Leonard Kemner and with Wilco Kelderman, with Ackerman, with Peter Sagan. I mean, that team is gonna be unreal. But to have a distinct leadership in that team, I'm absolutely asking myself a lot of questions right now. Another riser, I would say, who also is growing into a strong helper for the team is Matteo Fabro. I mean, to be fair, Bora Hansgrohe as a whole have just a really deep team. They may not have loads and loads of, of top star riders, bar Peter Sagan, perhaps marquee names in cycling, but they have a really deep team with plenty of just strong riders. So we now move on to the section of the podcast where we're going to take a look at a specific rider we have a particularly close eye on throughout the season um, and who we think really could maybe spring a surprise throughout 2021. I'm going to go for a rider who perhaps isn't the most uh, unknown of riders we've done in this section so far. I'm going for Leonard Kemner. Now 24 years old, he rode the Tour de France last season and he didn't just ride it, he, he, he won a stage ahead of Richard Carapaz from the breakaway. Um, he came second as well, like we mentioned to Danny Martinez. Lenny Kemner has the makings for me of an excellent Grand Tour rider in the future. He's going back to the Tour de France this season. We know Bilko Kelderman is going there as well. I think... You asked me earlier who's stronger of the two. Probably I'd say Kelderman for now. We'll see at the Tour de France for sure because Kemner is growing every single season rapidly as a rider. And if Wilco Kelderman isn't on form, we know he he's crashed pre-season Kelderman. He's currently out injured. If that's again a problem for Kelderman this season, Kemner leading a Grand Tour, leading a Tour de France would be an intriguing prospect for sure. Maybe he's probably, for me, in the same boat as someone like David Gaudu. Probably not quite ready yet to lead the team at the Tour de France. But would be fun to see for sure. And if not, we could see him win more stages this year at the Tour. That's an interesting comparison with David Gaudu. I think Kemna might be a bit more suited to um, a Grand Tour win than Gaudu. So maybe a bit more like a Brandon McNulty. 
Um, but yeah, well, yeah, winning on the Dauphiné, nearly getting two stages on the Tour de France, which, I mean, it's it's absolutely incredible for him. Uh, he's like, he's 24, I think. Um, just incredible rider, very promising. And uh, he's also like top 20 de Liège, I think, last year, or borderline top 20, just a minute down on the likes of Roglic. So he can potentially develop himself into a, a GC guy that knows also how to uh, to win classics. Um, so yeah, I think you've mentioned him and Kelderman. I would say today that Kemna is the best hope for a GC ahead of Kelderman. That is a massive call. I mean, to be fair, it's not a massive call because Kelderman, I mean, he had a great Giro. As a whole, to be fair, I think he surprised a lot of people at the Giro last season. But he's probably, more often than not, not performed to what you'd expect. And so far in Kemner's young career, he's he's done the opposite. He's just grown every single race he's ridden, it seems. And looking at his calendar earlier in the season, he's set to ride the Volta Catalunya in March. I'd love to see Lena Kemner lead a one-week race for Bora Hansgrohe like, uh, like Catalunya. Now... The rider I will be watching um, this year is going to be one of their new signings. Uh, joining them from cycling team Friuli in Italy is the 21-year-old Giovanni Aleotti, born just a week before me, so definitely does not make me feel old in any shape uh, or form. Um, but he's had a very strong year. He raced only on, on Italian soil, um, getting fourth at the uh, Giro Ciclistico d'Italia finishing fifth in um, in Aprica, which is a very famous climb, obviously for those who follow the Giro, um, finishing ahead of someone like Filippo Conca, who has since joined um, Lotto Soudal, and uh, mainly behind Thomas Peacock, who that day was absolutely un- unbelievable. But he's 21, he's basically very versatile, um, he's a very decent climber, he's a decent sprinter, and to have him develop in a team such as Bora, which is very good for young riders, and having maybe a mentor um, like Daniel Os, for example, I think it's something very important. He's also finished second of the Tour de l'Avenir. We all know what we say about the Tour de l'Avenir. If you win it, two years after that, you win the Tour de France. Tobias Foss, I'm looking at you. Um, he finished ahead of someone like Ilan Van Velda or Clément Champoussin, who then developed into very decent riders. We've seen them uh, shine this year. So... Yeah, definitely a, a rider I'm keeping an eye on because I think Giovanni Leuti can be the next best thing. Looking at that Tour de l'Avenir, I mean, almost everyone in and around, even finishing behind Aliotti in the GC, has already made the step up to the World Tour and already shown a lot of promise. So um, I think we can definitely expect to see the same from Gio Aliotti in 2021, particularly on the mountains. But I will say there were just so many riders... You can pick from Bora Hansgrohe, um, who are intriguing. Ida Schelling is a very talented young rider. Even someone like Anton Palzer, who is a ski mountaineer, making his his uh, cycling debut this season. Coming over from a different sport reminds you of a certain Slovenian, Anton Palzer. I know a lot has, has been said of him being a great climber, and he'll make his debut as well later for Bora Hansgrohe. <laughs> who knows what he could become as well, just... So many intriguing young riders for Bora Hansgrohe, a very kind of exciting team to look out for, in my opinion. Now, Joe, let me put you on the spot really quickly before we wrap this up. Where does Emmanuel Buchmann finish his Guantel? Emmanuel Buchmann, I'm going to say it right now, is going to win the Giro d'Italia in 2021. <laughs> okay, wow. So, <laughs> wait, so that means that we haven't done Ineos yet, but we've both given a different winner already for the Giro. Wow. Anyhow, guys, hope you enjoyed our podcast on Bora Hands Grower today. We have plenty more team previews coming to you in the coming days, so make sure you click follow, subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to the podcast on. Obviously, we're having some cycling races as well at the moment, so hopefully um, we can start to maybe look at doing some other podcasts as well as these team previews around some races in the coming weeks. But anyhow, Guillaume, do you have a final word? Peter Sagan will be a four-time world champion come Siena 2021. Sagan in rainbows. Cheers, guys. Cheers.